in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is Jason Graham Nye, the co-founder and CEO of MealPass.org. Jason, thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much for having us, Kevin, from 10,000 miles away from you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, last time I introduced you, you were the co-founder of G-Diapers. What's happened since we last well, spoke? Well, I thought, why do one thing when you can do two? And so, yeah, since we last spoke, um, uh, concurrently with the work we're doing with G-Diapers, which is an eco-friendly baby diaper product and service, very much in the circular economy realm, um, I have, uh, with a few others, co-founded a business called MealPass millpass.org and uh and yeah very similar kind of uh philosophy around the circular economy and uh being uh, best for the world as a business as opposed to best in the world and uh yeah that's what we're up to so when people hear these words being thrown around this jargon that's thrown around circular economy best for the world what do you mean by that well it's interesting i mean we started g in 2005 before when, uh, yeah, when MySpace was kicking and Facebook <laughs> didn't exist and YouTube was nothing, um, we talked a lot about sustainability. And um, I think since that time, there's been a real, um, it's a graduation into this notion of circular economy. So essentially, we live in a world that's linear. We take, make waste. We take material from the ground, we make products, and then we waste. We put it in the landfill. So it's cradle to grave. A circular economy is cradle to cradle. You make products that are regenerative, so there is no such thing as waste. Um, you know, we are the only species on Earth that creates waste, which is kind of remarkable. And as of 2021, we are drowning in waste, particularly plastic waste. So on the diaper side of things, mm. our products, you know, cradle to cradle certified, meaning that the product um, goes back into the earth in a neutral or beneficial way. When we think about meal pass, that is a technology that allows restaurants and supermarkets, um, and the focus now is America, to list their end of day food that would otherwise be thrown away. Uh, they can be listed on the app and then um, those in need, those who are hungry can um, claim a meal on their side of the app, uh, go to the restaurant, collect that meal directly. So what does that do? Well, in the US, if you do that as a restaurant or supermarket, you can earn very lucrative tax deductions that are very hard to get. You're feeding the local community and you're reducing food waste. And just to frame this in post pandemic America, you've got a million restaurants and according to the National Restaurant Association, about 250,000 of them might not make it. So the app really supports those restaurants getting back on their feet with these tax deductions. Again, post-pandemic, 50 million Americans are hungry every day and a large proportion of families, uh, the app gets food to them uh, that would otherwise be going to um, the trash. And the last piece is food waste is the largest driver of um, global warming. And the idea that we throw away 30% of all the food we buy is extraordinary. So simple Australian built technology proven here in Australia, now launching in the US, we're excited. Triple bottom line, people profit planet. We can put money in the pockets of restaurateurs and supermarket owners. We can feed Americans and we can reduce um, food waste. So we're excited. <laughs> and I know that we produce enough food to feed everyone. We just don't yeah. distribute it properly. What are some of the constraints that uh you know business owners have ran into in order to distribute this profit you know uh distribute this properly as well as generate profitability and sustain it's a great question and we want to be clear here we work really closely with food banks and you know um uh feeding america is the peak food bank body in america we work with them we work with oregon food bank and others with discussions around partnerships they do amazing work but as many may have seen during the pandemic they were under the pump they were um, having to ration their food. What this, the challenge for restaurants is to give away end of day food that's already been prepared is quite risky. Um, you've got a food security issue. And then you just got the management. You've got, you know, do you have lots of people rocking up to the restaurant? And what this app does, um, a couple of things, because we're seeing the restaurant donate the food, we are protected by the Good Samaritan Act, which provides them protection when you give something charitably. But the app also offers, um, a double layer of protection where when those in need are collecting the food, um, when they go to that restaurant, they swipe uh, the app and that generates um, a the tax deduction paperwork for the restaurant side, but they're also agreeing to terms and conditions, including um, 
the fact that they themselves have to eat the food, they can't distribute it, and that they need to eat it in a timely manner. So we feel like technology, again, there's a lot of bad things we hear with technology and social media and what have you. This is a good example where technology really does bring and, and address three major problems. Now, Jason, you're, you're an experienced business owner. This is not your first rodeo. You know, what, what, are, what are some of the questions investors or people are asking you when they hear an idea like this? Well, it's interesting. Our first rodeo, rodeo um, was with our diapers. And, you know, there was with any kind of business opportunity, there's always like questions about how that work and what have you. And with, with G diapers, we've had lots of ups and a few headwinds and we're, we're getting back on track mostly um, in Southeast Asia and developing countries um, and also over in Europe. Um, we really do want to find ways to relaunch back in the US, but it's been a little difficult right now. With this business, it's interesting um, with technology. Um, I think we're so used to an inventory business with the diapers, and this is a technology, so it's like scalable, like, yes, ta-da! Yeah. It's like, oh, this is good. Um, I think, to answer your question, though, I think investors and others who ask the questions, um, it's been a fairly easeful ride. It hasn't been knocking down lots of doors. People get it, and I think they get it, particularly post-pandemic. When those three issues, you've got a Biden administration talking about build back better. You've got a Biden administration that's pouring trillions of dollars into addressing climate change. Um, you've got restaurants trying to get back on their feet and you've got a record level of those who are hungry. So when we talk to investors and potential partners, it's intuitively that they, they get it. I, I, to be honest with you, in the last, you know, since we launched a couple of months ago, we haven't had the conversation where it's a complete showstopper, where someone's like, what do you mean? So, you know, we're in the in the middle of a friends and family fundraising at the moment and it's been it's been fairly smooth sailing, which is good. <laughs> because and I'll say this, you must have seen this with triple bottom line businesses, so often the financials don't work. Right. You know, uh, you know, in, in the in the sustainable products world, it's always a premium. You you can't get a USD organic tea or a coffee that's same price or lower. But this business everybody wins uh, i find i'm i'm excited <laughs> oh yeah i'm sure and, and the, i remember asking about this earlier and just to bring the you know the people watching this up to speed you know for food banks sometimes it's canned food sometimes it's food that's a little bit older the, the, the food that you really don't want to eat and feed, feed your family with this is warm quality food that's coming out the back window that you can go pick up schedule on time and everything is kind of data driven now the question i have for this we both have our kind of footprints and, and, and roots in, in portland oregon right now they have a large homeless population so when we're talking about food insecure it's not just the homeless population let's be very clear about that they're they're struggling families that need food on the plate and, and have uh, unfortunate circumstances but what about that question what about that question about the homelessness? Is this going to incentivize more more people to maybe not get the funds to go get another meal? How do you see this playing out and the reaction from people dealing with the homeless problem, let's say in Portland, Oregon? Yeah, like we're in deep discussions with Oregon Food Bank and the structure of food banks, it's tricky. Um, it's, you know, they the, the state-based organization runs two or 3,000 food pantries. Mm. They're only open on a Sunday two hours so if you're food insecure you've got to get to that food bank and then it's tin goods um that's kind of hard and there's a dignity issue there sure. what we're finding we've got a soft launch with sonic driving which is a chain of um a burger a burger uh restaurants around yes. portland yep. we're finding that 85 percent of recipients are families this is families that are on there really struggling and the fact that they can get a warm meal every day with dignity is huge and the dignity piece is interesting mm. the Recipients feel like they are just like any other customer. And because we, we can now pay for product with our phones, when they walk up to the counter, it looks like they're paying for their meal. It's the exact same, it's, 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 it's the same, they look like a customer like you and me. It's, there's no difference. So the dignity piece is huge. For the employees of Sonic, they're finding that um, they're feeling great about what Sonic's doing for the local community. Because often it's the case that those who need a meal just wander into restaurants just begging and what this app does is it formalizes it. It gets them there at the time that suits everyone. It gets them a warm meal. So they're fed, food waste reduced, and the restaurant gets a financial credit. In terms of particularly Portland, because we lived there for 10 years, we know now that the, the homelessness is huge. If you think about the 50 million food insecure, you've got the most recently food insecure are people who might, you know, they have a home, they have a family, but just both 
both carers don't have a job, they're food insecure. Then you've got the the folks who are, you know, generationally homeless, and that's really hard too. And what we're finding with the pilot we did in Australia is that we can address both those markets quite well. Um, you know, both both the more recently food insecure and those who are really entrenched, we can we can work with both of them well. And the food banks help us. So the food banks distribute the codes to their clients um, and they know who those clients are and that's how we get the ball rolling. That's how we support Oregon Food Bank and other food banks to do their work. And what's important to know is that food mm. banks rely on the year on fundraising. So by tapping into this source of food that is otherwise going to waste and giving the credit to food banks, they then have a, and we amplify their work, we don't compete, we amplify it. They then can go and get raise capital, oh, sorry, raise their donation amounts each year from their donors by showing that their impact is now exponentially bigger. Hmm. So that's how the mechanics of it work. And for uh, the hardcore capitalists listening to this right now, how do you make money? Yeah, so we charge the restaurants $125 a month or the cheaper $1,000 a year. And if you're a restaurant and you serve, you offer eight meals a day, you will get $60,000 in tax deductions a year. Mm. So we think a $1,000 investment for a $60,000 deduction each year is a very reasonable investment. And the $1,000 itself is tax deductible. <laughs> Got it. I've become a tax guru. <laughs> And is this the Good Samaritan Act we're talking about? And is it the same deduction in like different states? It's actually, there's two different tax. Good Samaritan is a, a federal um, uh, law that says if you, give, if you give things away to those in need, um, you're protected if there's a problem with that product. Oh. Um, the IRS has a tax deduction, has, a, has this particular tax deduction. And again, we've worked with the four major accounting firms to verify it. It's just impossible to get. So the mechanics are this. Um, if you, want to, if you want to access that tax deduction, the restaurant has to prove they're giving a meal to someone in need and that person in need has to have, has to have a relationship with a food bank. And so right. in, in absence of an app, how would that actually work? Well, it doesn't, which is why it's just sat there. And every time we meet with large chain restaurants to individuals, they've never heard of this because it's impossible. And then you've got the timeliness, like the end of day food, it's gonna go off. You've got to get people there. And how does that work? So it's essentially, we've sort of created a virtual food bank in a way where the food's there every day. We know they're gonna throw X numbers away and we can work directly with those in need, but critically give the benefit, give the credit to the food bank. It, it, it's amazing. And I've, I've got to think, you know, there's just so many people listening to this right now and we'll listen to this that have worked you know in a fast food restaurant mm -hmm. and just know how much food is just thrown yeah. away and go why can't we do something more mm -hmm. and so what i what i want to ask you next is how did you come up with this idea you know i feel like you're in a, a uniquely positioned to have the experience uh you know in, in you know in the for-profit sector as well as with g diapers which also for profit but to now make this transition, how did this concept come into your brain and what also have been the differences from growing G-Diapers versus this software company now? Sure, so we moved to the States, lived there for 10 years with G-Diapers. We moved home to Australia five years ago to have our sons raised here in Australia in schools. And we learned a lot through G-Diapers. Like we came into G-Diapers with beginner mindset. You know, I was a Japanese interpreter. My wife had had successful businesses before, but. The whole thing of moving to America, raising capital was next level. And we learned so much. We survived the 2008 recession depression. We survived our biggest customer, Babies R Us, going bankrupt. Uh, we were taken on by the FTC over grand claims, which is exciting. As someone said to me, you haven't really run a business in America until the government's tried to come after you. So huge ups and downs, you know, and if you've never raised capital before, that's kind of a new experience. So we've been back in Australia um, working on GDARP as the next generation staff. But in the meantime, I was a school teacher before. And um, I think we had 15 hard earned le learned lessons. Like I've always said, I should, I should have done an MBA, but we kind of did one because we went and did stuff in real time. So this all came about because I was at a, a lunch sharing my story of GDARP as to four or five um, entrepreneurs here in Australia. And one of them, Ian Price, um, he is the co-founder of the business. 
He is from Denmark, moved to Australia with his partner and was here working in the food delivery business as a technologist, as a building the, the yeah. apps behind how those food delivery um, uh, companies work from a technology standpoint. And he'd noticed the food waste issue here in Australia. And so he was the one that built the technology and he ran an incredibly successful trial. So 90 days, 400 plus restaurants, including Subway and 7-Eleven and Aldi downloaded the app they provided 55,000 meals to those in need and they saved 100,000 pounds of food waste. That was Ian on his own with wow. that app, which is quite amazing. But the critical thing is in Australia, there's no tax deduction. That was 400 plus restaurants going, yeah, we should probably do that, mm. which is pretty remarkable. And it was peak pandemic yeah. last year. So we, I had this lunch, I was sharing our story about GDARPAs and ups and downs. And then Ian contacted me afterwards and said, you've obviously got experience in America we've found this tax deduction opportunity in America. Would you like to come on as the as one of the founders? Um, so that's kind of how it came about. I've got circular economy sensibilities. I see business as a force for good. I think capitalism can be fantastic if it's done right. And this, this just sort of came up over lunch. So we feel very blessed. It's incredible to think about. And software, incorporating something like an algorithm is what a lot of new entrepreneurs are doing. And, and really in its simplest form, it's just systems thinking. How do you create a system just like the circular economy that's sustainable in a way? And so in the long run, do you think that kind of the future of business are creating circular systems, using algorithms, using personalization, uh, using transparency and using this technology to redistribute, you know, uh, a surplus to people who need it most? Yeah, I think um, uh, I think systems thinking is absolutely required, and doing things in in um, disjointed sort of product based ways doesn't work. Systems thinking, meaning if, it, if it's a circular in the circular way, it's like you've got to factor in every element of it. Um, I'm in the I'm beginning I'm sort of a year into a PhD looking at barriers and enablers to a circular economy. And there's a theoretical framework called social practice theory. So it's all about consumption as a practice. Ooh. So you don't just drink that Coke, it's the practices around the drink as well. You're the social norms, for example. So you've got these, these elements, these three pillars of practice. So you've got the materials, the thing you're drinking, but you've also got your personal dispositions, your um, uh, what your beliefs are around a particular thing. Um, and then, um, you've got, uh, you then got the, 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 the social, the social world as well. So is it nor a normative behavior to drink that Coke or not? So the point of it all is, is that it's, I think only systems thinking is going to get us out of the trouble we're in, in terms of the climate. And, and that's different kind of thinking that the way products are usually developed. And I think technology holds great promise in terms of doing that, reallocating resources that are, you know, too much here, not enough there. I think there's huge possibility and, and opportunity. And, and now you're a world traveler. Uh, you speak Japanese, you said, you know, uh, why the United States? And are there, are there specific markets around the world that have really been adopting this way of thinking? Well, I think um, obviously America is one of the largest economies in the world. And there's a great um, there's a great opportunity to fix a couple of social ills going on there and also reinvent what capitalism can be. And there's the promise of capitalism. But there's also been the dysmorphia of capitalism. If you think back to the mid '70s, when shareholder activism took hold, and this notion that, you know, the 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 companies were there to in service for just one one element, which is the shareholder, as opposed to all stakeholders, that's sort of where we start seeing the declines. Mm -hmm. So I think America's America's a big opportunity to kind of rebuild. And what's exciting about this current administration is they seem to be, have the same kind of thinking. Yeah. So when it when we're thinking a little bit far ahead and you're trying to bring on these investors, are they understanding, you know, your belief system of systems thinking as well as, you know, not necessarily just maximizing their investment? I mean, you're trying to have trickle down to all the stakeholders, the community that you serve in, the, the food banks, the businesses, the, the, the people, give them dignity. What are investors saying or are they giving you any uh, Lash, lashback or questions about this way of thinking? They No, I think they're very surprised, very pleasantly surprised, surprised because I feel like in the impact investing space, um, often um, you've got a situation where 
it's described as triple bottom line, but the investors are really focused on just the one bottom line, the financial one, and the other two are sort of nice to have. It's, you know, the financial bottom line is the key. Uh, the people and the planet, mm, what they're finding, what we feedback, and it's early days is, oh, that is truly triple bottom line. You really are helping people profit and planet. That's remarkable. And it scales quickly because it's a, it's a technology. Um, so we, we've, we've been very pleasantly surprised at what investors and our, you know, our partners are saying to us. And, and I, you know, I've never, actually, we are working on developing an app, so I can't say I've never developed an app before, but in terms of like just the customer journey, the customer experience mm -hmm. for these people, you're working with the food bank, they're giving them the people the codes. Are you thinking of a, of a process or how do you make sure the app is very easy to use and walk me through kind of that process? Sure. So the beauty is we've done this trial in Australia, which is a huge thing for us because we can reflect and say, okay, 400, over 400 restaurants and supermarkets easily downloaded the app. That process wasn't difficult. They were able to think and, and say, okay, I want to list five meals at midday and five meals at 6 p.m. And they could do that every Monday and, and they do the whole week's worth of scheduling. So those meals are sitting there available, no problem. Then working with um, Food Bank Australia, which is our Feeding America, handing codes out to those in need. And again, that process. Um, those who are food insecure, the homeless, smartphones are prevalent. They might not have a data plan, but they have a smartphone and they know that to access Wi-Fi from somewhere or another. You just need Wi-Fi to download the app. Um, watching that process of onboarding, where they download the app, they receive the code from their food bank. It's only when you put your own code in, and that is your code for life, uh, that the restaurants in your area pop up um, on a map, which is brilliant, right? So you click that and you say, ah, and Dina in the Pearl, they've got five meals ready to be picked up at 5 p.m. I'll pick one and you hit yes and you claim it. So then on the app, five becomes four, becomes three, becomes two, becomes one. Mm -hmm. So and Dina, that lovely restaurant, doesn't have a queue of people out the front because it's just, it's limited to how much is available. Um, right, that makes sense. So I think it's really interesting. Um, so, so from an onboarding standpoint, we haven't had a lot of issues. Sonic has been working with, has been a uh, uh, soft launch partner. They've had a very smooth experience. In fact, the issue we have with Sonic is they've got more meals than recipients. And what's fascinating, Kevin, is when we, when we survey the recipients of the food, um, they feel very, they took a meal yesterday, they don't want to take a meal today because they don't want to take it from someone else. And we're like, no, 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 take the meal every day because if you don't take it, it's going to get thrown away. So it's right. a really interesting experience we've had. So it's been, it's a very smooth onboarding. Ian's done a remarkable job um, just getting the, the, the app to sync. I'm just curious to know if these large organizations such as the fast food chain of Sonic know actually how much food they're wasting here. Have there been any projections or estimates on that? Yeah, it's interesting talking to fast food chains, quick service restaurants, everyone, they are highly aware of it. And what's fascinating is that in California, uh, as of January next year, SB 1383, it's a new bill is coming in and jurisdictions are gonna have to, are going to force restaurants and food outlets to reduce their end of day edible food waste by 25% by 2030. So they're going to have to bring in measurements to actually figure out what's the baseline and how you're going to reduce it. Um, restaurants are highly aware of how much food they waste because if, if, as a pure capitalist, if they're buying raw ingredients that they then end up throwing away, that's just wasting money. So um, every restaurant knows how much they're, um, they're throwing away. One of the cool things with this app is we say, create a magic meal. You don't have to create a menu item, you could, but if you've got other ingredients, make a different meal if you like, or combine two things and put it together. And so to the recipient, they're getting a meal that's typically for Sonic, it's an entree and a side and a drink. Um, and then there's a cost of goods associated with that new magic meal, and that's how we calculate the tax deduction. But we're not restricted to, oh, it's not on the menu, we can't use it. Literally, a, a chef in a, in a standalone restaurant or anyone in a QSR can say, well, we've got a little bit of that and a little bit of that. Let's just cook it up and we can get it away tonight. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I'd be curious to know just like if how people would measure that through the app and if that would be very helpful to understand how much food, how many pounds, what's the, the carbon emissions. Cause let's talk mega trends for a second. You know, a lot of people are saying, okay, impossible burger and things like this are taking over because p consumers are aware about 
you know, this, this food chain's impact on the environment, methane, mm -hmm. greenhouse gases, right? I wonder what that would do for the public perception of fast food chains if they are, you know, giving away, contributing to society through these food donations to feed America and, you know, the citizens who have lost their jobs and are just struggling to find the meal. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, I think I think it's a huge opportunity. I think part of the, the story here is being able to give our restaurant and supermarket partners, uh, you know, a communications tool that shares with their communities that they are really part of the solution here because um, it, it is such a huge issue. So we're excited about the communication storytelling part of this, where we can um, we can collaborate with our partners to, to have them tell these really high impact community stories and hyper community. Like I'm in Australia, we're back in lockdown, right? So the only way I can leave this place is to go to supermarket up the road. Um, I think that's about it. Um, but we remember in the first lockdown last year, you got very community focused. And I think post pandemic in the US and globally, we might, that, that might linger. And so I think it's quite powerful for restaurants and supermarkets to talk about how they're supporting their local communities, particularly in Portland, where you've got such a huge um, uh, homeless rate. <clears throat> Jason, what do you need to make this happen? You know, you've grown a company before. What are you on to next? What are you looking for? Yeah, it's actually an interesting time. So literally the Australian government is preventing us from traveling overseas. That's gonna change, uh, sorry. And so my my wife, Kim, who is also a co-founder on the Mill Pass business, is, um, uh, has applied for an exemption to head, head to the US. Now, to do that, she has to stay out of Australia for at least three months, so it's quite full on. Her focus is sales and marketing. So what we really need, um, we've got a couple of things in the works. Um, from, a, from a spreading the word and increasing our enrollment of restaurants and supermarkets, um, Kim's focused on a summer impact team uh, program. We, we're reaching out to seniors in high school and um, college students who want to pick up some summer work with us really lucrative work because you get paid for every restaurant you bring on board and it's a great high impact job um, and it would look fantastic on a resume because we know this day and age in america you've got the average college student leaves with about forty thousand dollars of debt and there's just not the internships that there used to be so we see this as a really really great social entrepreneurship opportunity where you can make of it you can make it as big or small as you want if you're a college student in new york you've got the summer off you could grab this and say okay i'm going to build out my own team of uh, of friends and we're going to hit up you know the the west side the east side and we're going to get as many restaurants as we can and they can make it their own um, and i think that's powerful and important in this day and age where i think entrepreneurship is going to be the fastest growing thing out there um, and so uh the the focus for kim is to enroll those students to to then build a really like a it's a yeah a community-based um network of people who want to um who work with us with G diapers, we have in the past, and today we've got a few left, G mums who are really passionate about the brand and the product, and we see that there's somewhat of a replication there. And we see that generation, Gen, Gen Y, Gen Z, they get, they want to work with companies that have soul. They want to work with B corporations. Um, and so when we talk to them, so our kids are 18 and 16, and when we talk to them, um, we see that passion. It's intuitive to them. And so that's one piece um, is building out a group of um, like-minded sales uh, sales team members. Um, you know, we'd love to talk to any restaurants and supermarkets across the country. Um, uh, that would be fantastic. We are doing a friends and family round. If anyone's interested in investing in us, that would be fantastic too. Um, those are the big things, I think. Yeah. Well, it's it's just uh, it, you know it's full circle for me because a lot of people don't know you know one of my first interviews ever really was with you and Kim at the G Diapers you know headquarters and and you know, I was actually in business school at the time and you're so right and spot on that the next generation does get it except that's not what we are learning in business and mm -hmm. so for you know for the in business school rather so the you know the opportunity to work for an organization, you know, like yours and to be educated and, and to kind of pass that on, I think is very special. And I, I think that's, you know, why we consider you all real leaders. Now, what, for someone trying to organize, you, you talked about entrepreneurship really changing the paradigm for someone trying to organize a system, for someone trying to develop a strategy that incorporates the circular economy, where do I start? That's a great question. It does start with systems thinking. So it's two 
easy to just say, we'll replace one product with another. So if you think about disposable coffee cups, it's, it's a bit simplistic to say, okay, cafe, stop using disposable cups, just use, re, uh, just use um, washable cups. And then all of a sudden the system falls apart, like, well, hang on a minute, how do I take coffee and take it away? And so systems thinking is required. And we've seen startups that actually offer that sort of collection and delivery and cleaning of durable cups. You can sort of see that happening. Um, so um, it, what, what's really key is you can't just focus on swapping out one product for another. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece is, um, is the community piece, the people piece and getting buy-in. And why circular economy is getting traction is because Gen Y and Gen Z intuitively get it. You see circular fashion, you see rent the runway, you see um, these businesses that um, are taking, yeah, clothing's a really interesting one because it's a really dirty business where in, depending on the category, you've got, you know, fast fashion's being really um, pumped at the moment because the next generation are like, no. You know, it used to be that fashion was four seasons. Well, now it's 52 seasons because it's 52 weeks. So I think um, getting the community and the people buy-in is crucial. Um, and then really challenging social norms. Like, um, I don't know why I'm thinking about fashion so much, but, um, you know, uh, if you're a student at school and you're going to um, uh, a formal, a party with your friends, in the old days you'd buy a pretty expensive dress if you're a girl and you might buy a tuxedo and these days you can rent both those things and that's the norm so challenging social norms is huge um once you get those three things going those pillars um the, the people piece the object piece and then the sort of social norms then you've got a chance to actually shift um as you say you're right if you do go to an mba program now typically you're not really thinking about things circularly it is inherently complicated and i think we like to simplify things but the reality is it's really difficult to do that well, I'm thinking right now, let's, let's stay on fashion, uh, if you will. Let's, I just want to yeah. think about Patagonia for a second, you mm -hmm. know, and how complex, you know, the fashion industry is, all of those suppliers, yeah. the things you run into, how important are, you know, developing those relationships with those suppliers and, and also, you know, working around uh, or working mm -hmm. with other companies who have developed, you know, really strong relationships with other suppliers already. It is huge. And, you know, we were with G Diapers, we were the first um, consumer package good to be certified cradle to cradle by Bill McDonough. And the cradle to cradle process, um, and again, that's a certification that says that the product at the end of its life gets returned to earth in a neutral or beneficial way. That process, and that's the underpinnings of the circular economy, that process demanded that our, our, our manufacturer in Ohio uh, would then all the all the upstream suppliers of the product would sign an NDA with Bill McDonough at Cradle to Cradle and they would share their formulations. And so um, that process was super rigorous and really deep. And this was 2005. We just started. Right. So these suppliers are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, trust me, just go with me. Yeah. So the process <laughs> meant we had deep relationships with our upstream suppliers that we wouldn't otherwise have a conversation with. Our relationship with our manufacturer in Ohio also transformed. So we're a small company, they're a big company, multi-generational, fantastic company. They then adopted Cradle to Cradle. They, they completely refitted out their factory using Cradle to Cradle carpets and they recycle almost 100% of their materials. Incredible. And so the, the importance of upstream relationships with suppliers is massive because resource efficiency is so important. Patagonia is extraordinary in the transparency of that. And it's great that they take us on a journey. They don't say we're going to be 100% perfect tomorrow. I love that Yvonne Chouinard starts by saying, as soon as you open the doors and you're in business, you're destroying the planet. There's just no question. But this is what we can do. And so those relationships with suppliers are critical and more as critical is bringing your community of customers on board with the journey. Because what we found with GDIPers and we're finding with Meal Pass is that your community of customers is... Um, engaging with them is the most exciting fantastic thing you could ever do and it's so unexpected what comes out of those conversations and relationships now dive into that a little bit more for for business owners for entrepreneurs the community aspect of this engaged are you finding they're driven to the organization because of the the mission that goes beyond just profitability and then what is it specifically that uh, re-engages them into a conversation to purchasing the project, product again. 
Yeah, I think for both GDIPers and Millpars, people are drawn to the, the possibility and the promise which we had as when we started, which is when we left university and we got up those jobs and I was a stockbroker in Tokyo making lots of money but no meaning and, you know, my wife was looking for work that had a lot of meaning but where was the money and it was just, it was just hard. We found in both GDIPers and Millpars, you've got an opportunity where you can really do both. And when you share that with others, they're like, oh, I want to come on board too. So, you know, our very first employees at GDIPers were customers and they were really exhausted mums who, but, but who wanted to get back to the workforce, but only two or three days a week. And we're like, oh, that's perfect. With Mill Pass, it's interesting because we feel like that college age student is kind of an interesting, they're at a really exciting time in their lives in a tough spot with a pandemic. Um, and so we're excited to share this with them. And what we're seeing is people going, uh, heck yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> now, I, I just think it's a uniting concept mm. as well. You know, it's like, it's, 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 bet it's between parties. You know, it's, it's like, okay, I can do good for the environment, but also make money while doing it. Sign me up. And who wouldn't want to be yeah. signed up? And so I don't know if you've, you've thought farther, I'm sure you have, uh, past, uh, you know, milk past, but your employees, did you find that G diapers employees are, you know, geared and, and kind of driven toward your culture and values because of this? Yeah, absolutely. There's no question that they, um, they, they were drawn to it because of our values. Um, and with G and it's soon with mill passes, we build a team out there. We, the focus on, the culture and getting the culture right is huge. You know, our very first hire at GDIPers was a chief culture officer and that uh, David Sawyer was extraordinary. He helped me as a, a new CEO work through how do we hire, how do we fire, how do we have tough conversations, all of those things. And we see that the culture piece is so critical, particularly when you're doing something different, particularly when it's circular economy. As Drucker says, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And a lot of MBAs talk about strategy, 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 but it's all irrelevant without the people piece and the culture piece. And Gen Y and Gen Z, as we know, are not putting up with cultures that are unhealthy, you know, mm. cultures that are, are, um, are too, you know, are demanding and are, are, are lack of transparency and, and lack meaning and purpose. I find it fascinating with B Corporation in America that there's a whole business called B Work, which is a HR, it's an employment agency for people wanting to work for B Corporations and for B Corps to go and hire people. And if, if you're an investor looking at due diligence, you look at a B Corp certification and you get most of the answers there. If you're wanting to work for someone who's a B Corp, you, you kind of know them because you can see their assessment, their score. And so um, anyway, yeah, I think it's now's the time and this next generation of, of young people coming into the workforce, it's, it's the perfect match. They're not putting up with linear, they're not putting up with single bottom line. See, and we've got, a planet, we've, we've got a planet we've got to save. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it seems highly productive in terms of those workers coming to work inspired with an actual purpose behind it. Um, I am curious, though, uh, the word trade off. When, when you hear the word trade off, what do you think about that? And what would be the you said difficult decisions? What would be the most difficult decision you've had to run into or that you've encountered when it comes to profitability or planet? Um. I think there's inherent trade-offs and it's it can be really difficult and when you're getting down to product um, and product um, design there's no perfect material so you know we use cornstarch for our uh, baby diapers and it's not like cornstarch is perfect corn in, in america particularly is a really odd um, grain because it's massively subsidized you're competing with People, it's a food stuff for people. It's a food stuff for animals. It's a material that's very interesting from a biodegradable point of view. But there's still problems with with corn. So there's trade-offs everywhere. Um, I think the key, what we've found with with both companies, is if you've got a really strong north star, you know, and GDAP is ending plastic disposable diaper waste as we know it is the north star. The trade-offs kind of fall away when you're focused on serving that north star. Um, and we're finding the same with the, with mill pass. It's not easy, but it's not a total disaster. And I think trade-offs are a little bit um, from the old way. Trade-offs are a little bit economics 101. I think the opposite's often true, where you get these delightful, um, unexpected knock-on effects. As someone said, Ali Khalifa, if you put all your problems in the in the pile together, often you come out with a really elegant solution. So even with mill pass with Sonic, um, our restaurant partner in Portland, the unintended but lovely consequence was their employees are more engaged than ever. 
and because they they realize that sonic's really helping the community within which they all live and mm. so yes trade-offs can be definitely an issue but i think we're getting to a point where when you've got a circular um, structure you, you actually um, end up with a lot more benefits and jason from a, a leadership perspective how do you prioritize these these trade-offs how do you prioritize these constraints you know you, you guys have a long-term vision but when it comes to a quarter or or a month how are you prioritizing how you spend your time right um well i think from a the trade-off thing and the time management thing i think in every case serving your customers the most important thing so focus on how we get the best customer experience is is one of the, the most important things we do um, from a time point of view um, once we think that the customer's set and that might mean you know recruiting the team and making sure we've got the right team in place which goes back to culture which goes back to transparency which goes back to you know lots of lots of communication because we're living 10,000 miles away from America um, using tools that help that help that happen like slack and whatsapp and other things once you get that set and that's cooking along um, you know really making sure our customers are happy and by extension the people our team that are working with our customers then we try and get out of the day to day and think a little bit more long term and get above the business work um, on the business not in the business I think that's right to think well what's next what's the next possibility um, so that's that's what we try and do some some months it's like putting out a fire and you can never get above but other months you can ease up a bit and go okay where are we go <laughs> and from your experience you know a G diapers now going the meal pass when it comes to just managing and working with people to you what have been some of the biggest takeaways from how to build an effective culture that's productive and, and working toward a common goal well it's interesting we started before the b corp certification and but i talk about it a lot because what mm -hmm. we found with going through the certification is it's a great it's a great tool to bring a team together and every two years you get recertified and every two years you say okay how can we get more points here how can we be more sustainable in the office how can we rethink that product um how can we serve our community more how can we get more gender diversity on our board like it's mm. it's a brilliant tool just in and of itself um and then of course it's a global community so i found that very useful having a chief culture officer very early on was really helpful really it just you just end up becoming really tuned into what makes people um go and what, how you can work with people to achieve their goals and their dreams through the company and it might be that they're with you for a period of time and then they go off and i think and and, and start their own thing or lead another organization and i think that's the greatest success factor of a company is to have a team come together on a on a shared mission and over time they develop skills so that they feel like they can go and do their own their own thing um, I think you know in 2008 when the world stopped spinning uh, with the financial crisis, I remember putting up in front of the team the, our entire profit and loss statement, and as a group we sat there and said, "How are we going to reduce expenses?" And let's go. And it was I think collective intelligence is one of the most important philosophies, and we've had some of our best, best, best ideas in marketing from our ops guy. Mm. We've had some of our best ideas around. You know how to go to, into a new market from the finance guy so you never know where the wisdom is so putting people in boxes is really dangerous so collective intelligence across any issue i think is awesome it, the team comes together everyone knows that there's no bad ideas um i think that's yeah that's critical and, and to do that you know one has to have an open mind right mm -hmm. to start with what type of mindset have you tried to develop you know over these years to to be an effective leader yeah i think um i think underlying everything is optimism i think it's it's easy to go dark quickly particularly when you're in the sustainability space you can read all the data you like about the world's blowing up but just to try and set that aside and think maintain optimism is crucial particularly when you're with a team um you might need to put a bit of a face on to get through the the dark times but there's no point you wallowing and bringing the whole team down with you. Um, I think that's crucial. I think one of the big things we asked candidates at G um, when they were going through job interviews with us was, um, do you believe that everyone wants to do their best work? And that was a question that was binary. If you said no, you didn't get the job. And I think that's kind of interesting because it shows people, do you expect others to do their best work? If that's a yes, then there's this sense of, we're all in this together. 
and there's a sense of trust that I'm trusting you to do your best work, you trust me to do my best work, and that's never in question. Um, and so we found that to be an interesting thing to ask people. Because if there's a suspicion that, well, I'm doing my good work, but Kevin, I'm not sure you're going to pull your way, that's mm. a problem. That's corrosive. Um, mm. I think the other massive thing is just a high trust organisation is crucial. And, you know, with G, we had a lot of offsites, a lot of time together to really build high levels of trust. And there's sort of simple transactional trust. I trust you, Kevin, but it's transactional. So if you found me once, we'll never trust each other again versus huh. a much deeper level of trust, which is like, it's a different it's a different kind of level. And I think that's what you need. That's beautiful. Now, this uh, chief culture officer, yeah. what was his philosophy? And maybe what is your philosophy on, on firing people? Uh, yep. We didn't bring their best to work or didn't align with their culture. It's a great question. So firstly, in Australia, and my wife and co-founder Kim is Canadian, very socialist countries. In both countries, uh, we are not at will. If you want to fire someone, it's three written warnings and a real process. Mm -hmm. um, we moved to America and we had something happen. And I remember asking our lawyer in Portland, okay, I'll get the warnings going. And he's like, what are you talking about? America and Oregon is at will. I'm like, what's at will mean? He goes, well, you can fire someone at will. <laughs> and so I think that and the fact that employment in America is tied to healthcare, which is not the case in other countries, really weighed on us heavily when we thought about firing someone. Because mm -hmm. it's like, oh man, if, if, if we let this person go, they are out of healthcare and out of a job. And that's a double like, wham, like whoa. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the context of the whole issue of firing people. I think we, 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 had, we developed a whole series of different kinds of performance reviews. We were interested a classic performance review is once a year and it's totally gamed, right? You've gamed the heck out of it. You fill in the form and you might have, um, it's kind of a, it's theatre. What's interesting is really fast feedback loops. Like you're getting feedback and you're giving feedback and, um, you know, there's an assessment of you and you can assess others and that's the best way to go because that actually avoids a cataclysmic explosion at the end of the year where it's like, the, the, the person who's about to get fired is like, I didn't know I was going to get fired. Wait, wait, what? And the person doing the firing is feeling awful, but they're following some very old school procedure. Our, mm -hmm. our thing on, on how we retain great team members and how do we transition people out of the organisation where it's not working is very fast feedback loops. In some circuit, we, we used to do a 360 review live and verbally. So it wasn't like, I'm going to fill the form in and there right. you go. Yeah. It was in the circle of <laughs> trust. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's um, quite the circle. What's that? So that's quite the circle. Yeah, no. And what you, to do that, you've got to trust each other. And you can't BS. You can't say, oh, Kevin, you're a really nice guy. And it's like you as the person being um, assessed or being reviewed, you want the feedback. That's the irony in feedback mm -hmm. giving. The, the recipient, if you're curious about your own performance, you want to hear it and you kind of want to hear it unvarnished. It's so difficult in our culture to go, oh, I don't want to be mean to Kevin. You know, he's trying really hard. It's like, no, just give it to me. What's, what am I doing wrong? I'm always late for that meeting or my, my notes aren't very clear or I don't follow up. Just tell me. It, it's interesting. What, what's kind of uh, coming to my head right now is now with Meal Pass, with a tech company, with a software mm. a company, with Nap, can you replicate that trustful culture because I, I think about softwares or apps all the time and just, just infinite scale unicorn. We're going to uh, spend a lot of money and just hire a bunch of people and then just be indebted a lot until we can make, turn a profit. And through that, you kind of lose that trust. You kind of lose that, that bonding. What's your perspective on growth with a, with a new company like this? Good question. I think because at the heart of the business, we're helping feed Americans. And at the heart of the business, we are reducing sure. um, greenhouse gas emissions, like there's a real heart, a beating heart of this company. Um, it's interesting for us, we live in Australia, the businesses are in the US, we're very used to doing this. And so I think the beauty of collaboration tools these days, whether it's Slack or WhatsApp or regular Zooms, it's not, it's, it's come much further. And because of lockdowns and the pandemic, it's become much further. Having said that, um, you know, my, my wife Kim is trying to head over to the US to kind of get the face to face, because we know that's the gold standard. And, Right. I'm dreaming of the day we can have a fantastic offsite with our new Millpass team and really get firing.
it, you know, it's a difficult challenge and, you know, it, it takes someone like you, you know, or, or someone who is very intentional about that core mission to do something like that versus, you know, going straight for that growth and just growing, not really caring about the individual in that sense. Um, what is that to you? Is that leadership? Is that character? Is that uh, experience? What is that to you? Uh, that mix up yeah, individual like I that. I think it's a bit of both. I think I don't know I could have done that when I was 20 odd years of age. And it's funny because I think in the media, the vision of the unicorn entrepreneur is like a right. 20 year old kid in his hoodie. The actual data is that the most successful CEOs of startups are more like early to mid forties. Cause you need a bunch of life experience yeah. um, to figure out well, what is leadership. And if you've been working at a big company and then you step off, You've never done, and this is our experience. It's like, how do you raise money? How do you build a culture? How do you fire? How do you do all this stuff? So um, I think it's it's a combination of leadership, character that's been developed over time. Um, uh, those two things have probably come together. Yeah. Well, Jason, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Let's wrap this bad boy up. What is your definition of a real leader? A real leader? I think a real leader is someone who starts with the heart, who has a great um, vision for how the world could be in the future and follows that all the way to the end and critically brings a community of people along, whether it's employees or investors or um, partners to, to deliver that. It's a team sport, I think, not an individual sport. Jason, it's a pleasure speaking with you again for the, the third time now. Hope, <laughs> hope we have you on for the fourth and let's bring Kim back on. Let's make sure you know she's not jealous. Um, <laughs> but for Jason Graham, not. I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, start with the heart and follow it to the end. And always, folks, keep it real. Thanks, Jason. Thanks.